Well, of course, Ipe Mizuhara is no longer in the Dodgers dugout. And to hear Dave Roberts tell it, that might be a good thing. We'll dig into that and a lot more. So let's get locked on Dodgers. You are locked on Dodgers, your daily Los Angeles Dodgers podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey, Dodger fans, this is Locked On Dodgers, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Thanks to our everydayers for making Locked On Dodgers your first listen every weekday morning. Remember, the show is free and available on all podcast platforms and on YouTube simply by search, searching for Locked On Dodgers. And please subscribe wherever you're watching or listening right now. If this is your first time with us. My name is Jeff Snyder. My co-host next to me, that's Vince Samperio. Vince and I are both lifelong Dodger fans, just like a lot of you. We've also both spent time covering the Dodgers in the press box and the locker room. So we're not quite insiders, but we bring you the smart fans perspective on our boys in blue every weekday morning. Today's episode is brought to you by Game Time. Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code FIRSTPITCH for $20 off your first purchase of at least $150. And uh, Vince, the Dodgers wrapped up their spring training schedule there. The, every game for the next uh, seven months that the Dodgers play will actually count. Uh, and, and that's exciting. You know, it's baseball season. They've got 160 more regular season games and hopefully a bunch of postseason games too. After that, uh, the, this final game against the angels, they lost on a walk-off. Uh, you know, it's one of those things where it's like, okay, uh, I don't know that we can infer that much about John Rooney giving up a walk-off hit after Zahir hope misplayed a ball into a triple, uh, you know, probably not things that are going to come up in the in the stretch run this season. Uh, you know, it, it's spring training. They got their reps in. Uh, Eric Karras got to call his son pitching. Uh, you know, it was it was all fun. And uh, you got to go to a game just as a fan, not having to work or anything. Uh, so, you know, a lot of good stuff there. But uh, obviously one guy who wasn't there was Ipe Mizuhara, who, Ipe Mizuhara, who obviously got fired by the Dodgers last week. And uh, Dave Roberts opened up a little bit today uh, on Tuesday talking about Ipe and his absence and kind of, I wouldn't even say implied. He basically said it's a little bit easier now uh, because everything was going through Ipe regarding Shohei Otani. And now Roberts said that without Ipe there, they still have, you know, they have Will the Thrill there available to be the interpreter for Otani. Um, but Roberts seemed to say that uh, Shohei is just a little bit more open with his team. It's just more direct and that maybe it, it might end up being a good thing for Shohei and for the relationship with his teammates. Yeah. It's funny because, you know, I've been against the, all the conspiracy theories so far, but if you were to have a conspiracy theory and it involved a smear campaign against Ipe after everything came out, the train keeps on rolling because we found out we've we've found out just about a new thing every day for like the last three or four days uh, in regards to that. But, yeah, I mean, it's one of those. Jack Harris also had an article that he talked to some other people beyond Roberts and nobody by name, uh, all anonymous. But basically that it's Dodgers like coaches and everybody else weren't directly told by anyone to not contact or talk to like Otani directly about certain things. Uh, but that it was assumed because that's how you did with the Angels that it goes everything goes through Ipe. Uh, now that that's not there, it appears to be a little bit more open. The the reports have been that you know Tony's been talking to his teammates a little bit more. They've been approaching him a little bit more. He uh, in English, and you know Robert said he we're gonna find out that he knows more English than we thought or some some to that extent. Uh, you know which also can can add to some of the stuff that's going on outside of it. Uh, but on the baseball side of things, if he, if you know, whatever it was, obviously there was always you know a, a kind of aura around Otani and that involved eBay because it, it did seem like you know that nothing really happens without him there or or part of it. Uh, you know, there's still celebrations and all that going on and joking around, I would imagine. But if it opens it up and Otani's you know more comfortable with teammates, happier around teammates, uh, they're more you know likely to bring him into jokes and inside jokes and everything that happens. Uh, I'm going to take it and I'm going to take everything like said at face value and, and uh, you know, we'll, we'll see what happens. Yeah. And, and it's kind of like when, you know, when a friend breaks up with their significant other 
and you're being supportive. And so you're like, uh, I never liked her anyway, you know, and, and sometimes it's true. Sometimes you really did never like her and, and didn't think she was right for him. And sometimes you're just saying that to make him feel better, you know, and, and it's hard to tell really for sure. I, which one applies to Roberts here in that analogy? Uh, did he really, had he even thought about it or is it something that just after the fact, like, Oh yeah, this is easier now. Like maybe it hadn't really bothered him when EPA was around. Uh, but now looking back and, and on, you know, you and I've had a couple private conversations, not on the, on the podcast about how you see things in a different light when, you know, new information comes out. Uh, you know, I've jokingly said we should have known that EPA was a villain with that hairdo. Uh, but you know, that's just, you know, now I look at it and I'm like, wow, that's definitely a villain's hairdo. You know, before it was just like, that guy's got weird hair, but, you know, I didn't really think much of it. Um, and obviously the, the the hair doesn't actually make him a villain. Um, but, you know, it, it could be a thing where in a different light with Roberts now believing what Otani said, saying, oh, yeah, now I can interpret all of this uh, Ipe's helpfulness as being interference and being controlling uh, and that sort of thing. And, uh, yeah, so it's you know, it, it's probably a, a mix of a lot of those different things. Um, but, you know, in the end, if it does help uh, Otani maybe be more just one of the guys or whatever, uh, that that might end up being a good thing. Yeah. And, you know, Roberts used the word difficult specifically to kind of, you know, talk about the the Ipe and Otani and, and kind of the buffer that was there. He used the word buffer as well. And again, I, I, I from all we know, uh, from like Angel's teammates, they were, you know, cool with Otani. They liked him as a teammate. You know, I'm sure some of them said it. I don't know if anyone said it directly, but maybe in, you know, privately or anything that everything that go kind of surrounds Otani might not be the most fun thing. Uh, you know, the fact that you're playing next to one of the best players possibly of all time or most talented for sure, uh, you know, can kind of eat into that. But with the Dodgers, it's a little bit different just because, like, they're going to have all this stuff and they're going to be winning, you know, realistically. So that's obviously going to be different. Uh, you would imagine you were going to get a little bit different side of Otani maybe in that sense. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, if it's one of those where just everyone – it's not the fact that, like, Ipe has gone, I would say, per se. It's more the fact that, oh, we can just go up and talk to Otani. And, and you know, obviously that's because Ipe has gone, but it, I don't think it's a matter of – Ipe was an issue it was more so like people didn't know how to act around Otani and now they know oh I can just go up and say hey Shohei how's it going or whatever and and you know bring him into conversations yeah and, and the fact that you know Robert said we probably will find out that Otani knows more English than we thought you know some people obviously are going to jump on well then he definitely should have known what was going on but the fact is Ipe was still that buffer that layer between Shohei and the English speaking world of, you know, reporters and teammates and everything. And so even if Otani could have understood stood the English doesn't mean that he had the opportunity because, you know, if people are going through Ipe to get to him, Ipe can't, you know, I, I saw one, uh, one person in our YouTube comments who speaks Japanese said that uh, even at the introductory press conference, when Otani uh, what Otani said in Japanese was that uh, when he saw the reports of the flight to Toronto, uh, that he was surprised. Uh, but then Ipe translated that as saying he was amused. And uh, not that I think that was uh, uh, deliberate, but, you know, just little things like that. Like, it's so, it's different. Like, it, I, I even get uh, a little bit not nervous, but I don't something, I feel weird when I read an article that says, you know, a quote in English and says, said Otani through his interpreter. It's like, okay, what did he actually say? You know, I, I wish that, uh, I, I wish that I knew Japanese basically is what it boils down to. Um, but yeah, it's, it's the fact that Otani knows some English is probably why he did recognize in the locker room. Okay. This is, there's weird stuff going on. I, I, not totally fluent, but I can, I can tell enough. And I think Otani's baseball English is probably really good. Uh, you know, the, it's a different language, like, and, and you get that all the time. People from totally different backgrounds, Japan is not the first and won't be the last foreign country to have players in major league baseball. And there's a lot of Spanish speakers and, and those guys, you know, I remember talking to uh, former cub, John Baker, 
on a podcast one time and he was talking about the best thing that ever happened to him was getting paired in rookie ball to be roommates with a, a guy from Venezuela. And he said, it just totally forced them to, okay, what words do we both know? Let's use those ones. And so, you know, I'm sure Tony's great at baseball English. And so he can pal around in the dugout, you know, whereas even if he doesn't necessarily know all the ins and outs of financial fraud and massive theft uh, in, in English, he, he can talk to baseball players. Yeah. And, not, and, you know, we've, I've seen a few other things on the translation front in terms of, you know, Ipe didn't always translate and, you know, we, everything we've seen from translators has been kind of the same. You know, the player says something and the translator says it for me, at least when, you know, there's Spanish translations, I can tell when it's not directly translated and, or, you know, maybe the, the tone was different or the, you know, whatever. The one thing, you know, why Will ireton has been so praised and kind of what we saw at the, at the, pre, at the press conference is that, you know, he was taking notes and, you know, seemingly asking Otani for either clarification or, or whatever it was. And that's something we've, I don't think I've ever seen from an interpreter, at least with the Dodgers uh, and maybe even in, in baseball in general of like, you know, the nuance, you know, knowing, you know, taking notes, figuring out, because sometimes the guys talk forever and then you kind of might lose your place. And even though you know what he's saying, it's hard to remember everything and say it back. Yeah. Yeah. So I was impressed with Will the Thrill too. And, you know, it'll be interesting to see what happens. It's definitely going to be a different dynamic with a different interpreter and how much he uses it. Uh, we're going to come back in a minute. We're going to change subjects. We're going to talk about Mookie Betts. His defense looked pretty shaky in this final game of the freeway series. We're going to talk about uh, whether we're concerned with his shortstop play and what the alternatives are. So thanks for making Locked On Dodgers your first listen. And please keep it Locked On Dodgers. This episode is brought to you by Prize Picks. Prize Picks is the largest daily fantasy sports platform in North America. It's the easiest and most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. It's just you against the numbers. Instead of, instead of battling thousands of other players, including pros and sharks, you just pick more than or less than on two to six player stat projections and watch the winnings roll in. You know, football season might be over, but there's all sorts of basketball going on with the NCAA tournament. There's an NBA uh, gearing up for the playoffs, all that stuff. You can get in on the excitement with prize picks. America's number one fantasy sports app where you can turn your hoops knowledge into serious cash. And you can now win up to a hundred times your money on prize picks with as little as four correct picks. You can turn $10 into a thousand with NBA, NHL, college basketball entries today on prize picks. Uh, and it's available in California uh, along with Texas, Georgia, and a total of more than 30 States across the country. So you can, uh, Put your sports knowledge to the test. Again, all you got to do is pick more than or less than on stats that you think, you know, whether it's, I think that Tyler Glasnow on opening day, I, I'm not sure what the more than less than number is going to be for Glasnow on strikeouts, but I think you're pretty safe picking the more than uh, and, you know, pair that with some other things you're confident about. You can make some pr pretty good money. So download the prize picks app today and use code locked on MLB in all lowercase for a first deposit match up to a hundred dollars. Pick more, pick less. It's that easy. Hey, we're back. We want to thank you for making Locked On Dodgers your first listen every weekday morning, especially our everydayers. We really appreciate appreciate all of you. If you're not an everydayer, it's easy to become one. Just watch or listen every weekday morning. And the easiest way to do that, of course, is to subscribe wherever you're watching and listening right now. You can also go beyond the podcast and become a Locked On Dodgers insider by going to joinsubtext.com slash Locked On Dodgers. It's a text message-based service. We send out alerts, uh, you know, our thoughts on news and and whatever, and you can reply to us, have one-on-one -on -one text conversations. It's just a few bucks a month, free 14-day trial. Go to joinsubtext.com slash locked on Dodgers. And be sure to check out Locked On Sports Today and Locked On Sports Los Angeles, the two 24-7 streaming channels over on YouTube from the Locked On Podcast Network, giving you everything you want to know in the world of sports or the world of Los Angeles sports. Uh, and a little bit, uh, before we jump into Mookie Betts, a uh, little bit of news in the National League West. Uh, after last week, the Giants signed Blake Snell. Uh, on Tuesday, the Diamondbacks signed Jordan Montgomery. So uh, I think that means that all of the, the Scott Boris clients have now finally signed. I think if you add up all their contracts, they might add up to as much as Blake Snell was hoping to get by himself. Uh, but, you know, it's a, it was a crazy offseason for Scott Boris and his clients, but uh, Montgomery signed with the D-backs one year, $25 million with a possible vesting player option for another year at about the same money. Uh, D-backs, it's another solid pitcher in the rotation. It's definitely uh, 
yeah, D backs pitching was going to be pretty good anyway. And now this makes it even better. Uh, So, you know, we'll probably dig into that a little bit more in coming days, but just want to mention that. But in this last game of the freeway series, Dodgers lost four to three Mookie Betts uh, struggled a little bit defensively, uh, had three misplays in one inning, uh, including one that was an error, one that he turned into an out, um, just a rough inning. And, you know, we, the concern with Gavin Lux was his throws with Mookie. It seems to be more about the glove and whether that is, you know, a footwork thing or a glove thing, just getting used to the position. Uh, I don't know, Vince, is, is it too early to, to start worrying about this? I mean, most people are probably already concerned about it or have uh, some, you know, thoughts about it. We've been, uh, you know, here on the fact of, I don't think he's going to play gold glove defense at shortstop, but I think he'll be competent and, you know, the plays that he misplayed that he didn't make, uh, you know, were not, I wouldn't say routine, but routine for a good shortstop. Uh, I would say, you know, back canning the ball seems to be an issue. His first misplay after he was named shortstop was on a backhand. Uh, two of the ones yesterday were on backhands when he completely missed one that bounced out of his glove. Uh, you know, even in Korea where the place he did make, there was one that, you know, similar play to the one he had last night to make it out was came out of his glove, but still had the time to get the ball and get the out at first. So I think, It's one of those where I feel like he's going to get more comfortable as time goes on, I would hope, and he's going to be fine at shortstop, and he, you know, he's not going to have a lot of those misplays anymore, but it's just a matter of how many times is it going to happen before we get to that point. That's what we don't know, and that's where I wouldn't say concerned. You know, we we use that word a lot in terms of, like, how we feel or don't feel about this. I would say that I can see the path to where it becomes an issue. Which might be semantics, but you know that's our part. That's why we speak. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. It, it's kind of interesting because he played a solid second base last year, uh, better than solid. He was a good defensive second baseman, and ground balls are ground balls. I guess the difference is maybe you do get more backhand plays at shortstop, and uh, you have that in the back of your mind that when you do make the play, you didn't have to throw the ball 115 feet instead of. 80 feet or whatever. It's a longer throw. And so maybe there is more of a, a rushed feeling or uh, not quite letting yourself get in quite the right footwork position, whatever it is. Um, I, I guess I'm, I'm hopeful at this point still that, that Mookie can, and can figure this out. And I, I feel like I have to be hopeful for that because the alternative is uh, Miguel Rojas at shortstop and taking somebody out of the lineup. And, and the fact is Mookie Betts and Gavin Lux are both significantly better hitters than Miguel Rojas. And, you know, we, we've, we've often, we've gotten a lot of comments over the last month or so about how the Dodgers have plenty of offense. They ought to be just be playing Rojas at shortstop and, you know, trade Gavin Lux or fire him into the sun or whatever. And I, I really like Gavin Lux's offense. I think him at the bottom of the lineup, uh, is is going to be a spark light. I think it's going to be really important for the Dodgers off- offensively. The question is, can the defense be good enough that it's not totally offsetting all of the value of Lux's offense at, uh, in the nine spot, you know? Yeah, and realistically, we haven't had any defensive issues from Lux since he moved to second base and kind of took over. So the question, you know, does go to Mookie, but it goes back to Lux because Mookie's not coming out of the lineup. Lux would come out of the lineup in, in that regard. And it's yeah it's one of those where you know i've even said it oh the dodgers you know in reality have enough offense you know they won 100 games with rojas playing a lot of shortstop last year they could do it again easily but it's also a matter of all right i've seen Oscar and he can strike out a lot and i've seen james outman and he can strike out a lot and you know jason hayward can strike out a decent amount and then you get to gavin lux and at least you know that's someone who normally doesn't strike out too much is a little bit more contact guy puts the ball in play so yeah the bottom of the lineup while it's going to be good overall there's going to be games where you get strikeout 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 and then you have Gavin Lux come up and you know hopefully spark again to for the top of the order so 
we they did say reiterate that against left-handed pitching rojas will play some short mookie might play some second you know not every left-hander but i would imagine whatever matchups are toughest for gavin luck specifically or if you need the day off whatever the case is but i do think you know mookie hasn't done anything yet to make you know and especially not in a regular season game to make me think okay panic mode throw rojas at shortstop and let's see him bat every day I would say give Mookie a month or so, and if uh, you know it doesn't work out, then they can kind of reconfigure and re, you know, and and hope the Brewers start off in a, you know five and twenty two or something like that. Yeah, that's where I'm at too. And you know, there's also just in the back of my mind the fact that right field isn't really locked down for the Dodgers right now, and you know, would the the solution be instead of taking Gavin Lux's bat out of the lineup? if they need to move Mookie out short, would it instead be taking Jason Hayward's bat out of the lineup and move Mookie back to right field? You know, and I, I think they probably don't want to do that, but I, I guess it's a nice fallback option to know, well, we do have a guy who's won six gold glove awards in right field out there available to put out there. Um, you know, cause it, that's less of a downgrade offensively, you know, Hayward to, to Rojas instead of Lux to Rojas, I think. Um, and, and obviously all that depends on, which version of Jason Hayward we get this year. Maybe Hayward hits well enough that it's a, a non-issue, but uh, you know, it's, or even, you know, when it, when it is a left-hander in the lineup or in the, on the mound for the opponent. So Hayward's going to be out of the lineup anyway, maybe sometimes move Mookie out to right field. So you keep Lux in the lineup, you know, and go with Rojas at short and, and Mookie in right field. I, I, I guess over the last couple of weeks, I've started thinking, uh, it's at least a little bit more likely that we actually will see some right field Mookie this year than than I would have thought a month ago. Yeah, I know he don't want that, but yeah. Opinion. Yep. Um, all right. Yeah. So we'd love to hear your thoughts. You know, if you're watching on YouTube, shoot us comments in the YouTube comment section. Uh, you can hit us up at all the contact info we'll give you in a minute. Uh, we're going to come back in a minute. We're going to talk about some uh, some predictions for the coming season as this is the last episode that Vince and I are recording together before the regular season starts. We're going to talk about some predictions, so please keep it locked on Dodgers. This episode is brought to you by Game Time. Buying tickets shouldn't be stressful, but it always is, whether it's sports, music, comedy, theater. It's really stressful trying to get tickets. Maybe you're looking for tickets to the Dodgers home opener on Thursday. Whatever it is, Game Time is the only ticketing app that gives you complete peace of mind with your purchase. You can see the view from your seat before you buy, so you know exactly what to expect when you arrive. All in prices show your total up front, so you know you're getting a great deal before you check out. You can buy tickets in two sec in seconds with two taps, and they have the Game Time guarantee, which means that you are guaranteed to get the best price. If you find tickets in the same section and row for less, Game Time will credit you 110% of the difference. So take the guesswork out of buying tickets with game time, download the game time app, create an account and use code first pitch for $20 off a minimum $150 purchase terms apply again, create account and redeem code F I R S T P I T C H for $20 off your first purchase of at least $150 download game time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. We are back. Thank you again for making Locked On Dodgers your first listen every weekday morning. Remember, you can become a Locked On Dodgers insider by going to join subtext.com slash Locked On Dodgers. And you can check out Locked On Sports Today and Locked On Sports Los Angeles, the two 24-7 streaming channels over on YouTube from the Locked On Podcast Network. Uh, and so, Vince, we've got uh, we've got a real game coming. There's a day off on Wednesday and then the home opener, we're, we're calling it opening day. The Dodgers have already played two games, but it's opening day around Major League Baseball. The other 28 teams will kick off their seasons, and the Dodgers will kick off their domestic season on Thursday, 1 p.m. against the Cardinals. And, you know, as I mentioned the other day, you're going to be doing tomorrow's episode solo because I will be driving down to California so I can be at that opening day game. Uh, and so as our last episode together before – the regular season really kicks off. Thought we'd uh, go with a couple bold predictions each, and uh, you know, see what see what we can uh, predict for this Dodgers twenty twenty four team. Uh, what's your first bold prediction, Vince? Yeah, I don't remember my other bold prediction that we made a few weeks ago. So uh, I know one of them was I think seven guys are going to hit twenty homers. I think that was what I said, or six, 
probably seven. Um, my prediction is that somebody the the outfield is not going to be the same on opening day as it is in starting in June. I think something's going to happen. I don't know what, but there's going to be a shakeup where either it's someone's not hitting, someone uh, starts hitting, someone gets hurt, and someone comes up and starts hitting. But I think that I don't think Jason Hayward and or James Outman and or Tay Oscar is going to be an everyday starter in June. Okay, uh, you th- you're thinking Andy Pajes or Miguel Vargas or what? Yeah, pro- if it's somebody that comes up, Pajes. If not, it's going to be somebody gets hot like Kike or Taylor, and they kind of stay out there. All right. Um, my first bold prediction is that uh, we will see back-to-back-to-back home runs from Mookie, Otani, and Freddie at least twice this season. Uh, Back-to-back-to-back doesn't happen very often, but those three are going to do it at least twice this year, uh, including once to start a game. That would be fun. Uh, Yeah. Yeah, I feel like back in like 1987, Maybe the Mets had back to back to back to back homers to start a game. I feel like I had a like a record breaker tops card of that. I feel like Kevin McReynolds was involved, um, but I, yeah, I might have just made that whole thing up. Nope. Nineteen eighty eight, I think, because I think I can picture the eighty nine tops record breaker card. So uh, yeah, something like that. Uh, so I don't know. And maybe Will Smith will make it back to back to back to back one of those times. But uh, I don't know if I'm ready to be that bold in my prediction. Yeah, uh, this next one, I don't know how bold it is because I, you know, well, I do know it's bold enough in the past, but without Kershaw here, maybe not as bold. But I think in the Dodgers starting rotation, the pitcher with the, the most wins is going to be different from the pitcher with the most strikeouts, which is going to be different from the pitcher with the lowest ERA. Okay, uh, you want to put any names on any of those? No, uh, they, I, they're they all interchangeable. Uh, between the you know Yamamoto, Miller, and Glasnow, and then you know obviously you know Stone or somebody else could surprise, but I think I don't think we're gonna have one clear cut guy that's like oh yeah that's the guy. I think they're all gonna have different strengths. Okay, uh, I like that. Uh, my ne- my next one is along similar lines, but in the bullpen, uh, I think the Dodgers are going to have ten different relief pitchers have at least one save this year. And uh, I, I think Evan Phillips will have the most, uh, but I think, you know, Gratterall and Joe Kelly and, you know, are going to get a handful each. And then there's going to be, I, I feel like everybody, almost everybody who pitches out of that bullpen for the Dodgers, you know, there will be, I, you know, I think Ryan Yarbrough will get a three inning save once. And, you know, there's going to be, I, I think we're going to just have almost everybody who pitches in relief for the Dodgers this year is going to get at least one save just because of how they're using guys and, you know, the just the situations are going to come up and using Evan Phillips at different times other than the ninth inning. Uh, so I think we're going to see those sa- saves spread around a bit. All right. Uh, I was going to go something along the line of the Dodgers will have the triple crown, but not, but realistically, I think Freddie is going to lead the league in RBI. So I'll go with that as my bold prediction. Uh, you know, batting in the three spot, obviously, but uh, with the guys ahead of him. And, you know, knowing the type of hitter, he, like a 300 hitter that sits behind Mookie Betts and Shohei Otani realistically is going to easily break 100 RBIs, you would think. And I think he's going to get up there into the 120s and lead the league. Especially because he's not your average 300 hitter. He's not Luis Arise just slapping singles. Yeah. He's a lot of extra base hits. We saw a home run on Tuesday night. And, you know, obviously he's going to get his share of doubles. Um, I, I had a, a few that I was... Uh, tossing around i think i'm going with uh for my last bold prediction max muncie is going to finally top the 40 home run mark this year uh and maybe even more impressively he's going to top the 230 mark on batting average uh and and so you know i don't think he's going to be a 300 hitter but i think muncie's going to hit you know somewhere between you know 240 250 somewhere in that ballpark and and hit 41 home runs I thought Probably about, won't have 70 stolen bases, though. Yeah. I thought about 
uh, doing some with Muncie, but I think I went all in on Muncie one year and it didn't work out for me. So I'm not going to go in. 2022 was your Muncie year. <laughs> I'll, I'll leave it be. And, uh, you know, we'll, we'll see what happens. Hopefully I'll have better luck than you did with Muncie. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right. I, you got any other, uh, any other last minute thoughts before the season starts? Uh, not about season, but you know, the moment last night with, uh, Eric Carros and his son on the mound could have been better at Dodger stadium, but, uh, you know, he got, he, he looked decent. Uh, you know, he, there was still major league hitters of the angels in the lineup and he was able to get out and, I think even trying to run around third base and, you know, Eric Carlos got to be there and give him a little standing O on, on the broadcast. So that's cool. I mean, I didn't see that part till after, but. You know. Yeah. Yeah. The, uh, the changeup is legit and the, and the slider has some good depth. You know, the fastball velocity is nothing to write home about, but if you've got two solid pitches to play off of it, you know, it's, uh, it's interesting at least, um, you know, and the fastball is not terrible. It's, you know, low to, you know, I, I think it was maybe got up to 94, but more like 92, 93 ish. Uh, but the, the slider had some, some good depth and it's a kind of a hard ish slider. It was like, you know, 80, 88, I think. Uh, and then the change up right around 80 high seventies to 80. And, and it's got some really good depth. He, he made some guys look, uh, look pretty bad with it. And, you know, like you said, there, it wasn't necessarily the the starting lineup for the angels but it's still you know real real hitters and and he looked pretty good so uh yeah it, it was definitely fun as, as a dad like uh somebody asked me on on twitter because like you could see Karos like charting pitches like still keeping score and i i said yeah for me i would have to like i always am the scorekeeper for my son's games because it gives me something to do other than stress about how they're pitching and uh so it's nice to have something else to to focus on felt bad that Karos uh, was supposed to his job was to be talking and he, it's hard to talk there you know and he so it's definitely more of a personal thing and not saying a bunch but uh yeah it, it was definitely fun to see as a dad and as a Dodger fan and you know Karos being a former Dodger and you know it, it was all pretty cool uh I guess that'll do it for us for for us today uh like I said tomorrow it'll just be Vince and then Thursday night after the home opener, we will do one together. We will both be at the game. So it'll be a few hours after the game that we will do that episode uh, to wrap up the week, to finish off the first week of our sixth season doing locked on Dodgers every day. It's been a lot of fun. Uh, we are past the five year mark into season six and should be a blast. We want to thank all of you, especially our everydayers for being with us every weekday morning. Again, if you're not an everydayer, it's really easy to become one. Just watch or listen every weekday morning. We love talking Dodgers with you and hope you enjoy it too. You can uh, become a locked on Dodgers insider by going to join subtext.com slash locked on Dodgers. You text back and forth with us, get our thoughts before the podcast. Sometimes thoughts that never make it to the podcast. A lot of stuff there. You can also check out locked on sports today and locked on sports, Los Angeles, the two 24 seven streaming channels over on YouTube from the lockdown podcast network. Uh, you can follow us on Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok at Locked On Dodgers. Vince is on Twitter at VinceSense91. I'm on Twitter at Snydog. Our DMs are open there. You can also email us anytime you want, LockedOnDodgers at gmail.com, or send us a voicemail or a text message at 323-863-LOCK-5625. We are here every weekday morning. We hope you'll be here with us. When you get in your car or sit on your couch, tell your smart device to play podcast Locked On Dodgers. And remember, you don't have to agree. You just have to listen. We'll talk to you tomorrow. Have a good one.